Welcome to the Unseminary Podcast. Are you looking for practical ministry help to drive your ministry further, faster? Have a sinking feeling that your ministry training didn't prepare you for the real world? Hey, you're not alone. Join thousands of others in pursuit of stuff that we wish they had taught in seminary. Buckle up and let's get started with this week's Unseminary Podcast. Well, hey, everybody. Welcome to the Unseminary Podcast. Thank you so much for listening in. My name's Rich, the host around these parts. I know that you're really busy at your church. You've got a lot going on this week as we head into the weekend, and I'm just so thankful that you would take some time out to listen in. And today, we've got a real treat. Uh, our guest on the show today is Dr. Tom Rayner. He is the president and CEO of Lifeway Christian Resources. You've probably heard of Tom before, so he doesn't need a huge introduction. He's written over two dozen books. On top of that, he's got a great blog, incredible podcast. Uh, Welcome to the show, Doctor. Well, Doctor is absolutely <laughs> not necessary. I mean, this, Rich, this is supposed to be unseminary, so let's 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 do away with the titles and let <laughs> let your audience hear from Tom and and not and not Doctor. The nice. only person that calls me Doctor is my wife, and she calls me Most Holy Reverend Doctor. Other than that, <laughs> let's just let's keep it let's keep it Tom. Does she call you Most Holy Reverend Doctor when you have to take out the garbage? Is that what's going on? Uh, that's when she orders me to take out the garbage, and I'm a you know she's a really sub- Submissive wife when I listen to her carefully. And so whenever she tells me to do something, I do it. <laughs> nice. Very good. Fantastic. Well, Tom, why don't, for people who don't know you, uh, why don't you give us the kind of one minute Tom story? The thing I appreciate about you, not only are you helping church leaders, you have such a passion really for church leaders. Uh, because of some of your background, why don't you give us kind of the, your, the, the Tom Rayner story? Very quickly, out of college, uh, I went into the family business, which was banking. Mm-hmm. And so I was a fifth generation banker. Uh, never had been a vocal vocational minister in our family. In fact, I don't think we were very church active uh, for several generations. And uh, the story my call is a story unto itself, so I'm not going to go into there. But I left the banking world and uh, uh, went to seminary. Mm. Uh, I did not know anything differently. I was a a 20-something, late 20-something guy. Uh, I was just you got you're going to ministry so you go to seminary and uh, i didn't know which seminary to go to mm-hmm. and so my pastor said i went to this one i said okay i'll go to that one too mm-hmm. and so we packed up uh had not been admitted we my family of then four had not been admitted uh, didn't have a place to live mm-hmm. packed up and uh uh, didn't have a job, and so I so I went from uh, the fast corporate track to unemployed. First job was uh, a janitor at Famous Recipe Fried Chicken. Oh, uh, nice! So things <laughs> things change quickly. From seminary, um, uh, four pastorates. Mm-hmm. Um, Kentucky, Indiana, Alabama, and Florida. Mm. And then from those uh, four, uh, because I uh, got an advanced degree, my my alma mater called me back and asked me to be dean of a school at the seminary. Mm -hmm. So I did that. So after those four pastors, it was during that time, uh, Rich, that I was also working with my side venture, which was consulting churches. Mm -hmm. Um, Really had begun it even while I was a pastor, but because of the nature of academia, I had more available time to Mm. uh, blossom that and was able to consult with the Several hundred churches, five or six hundred churches during that twelve-year period, That's great. and uh, then came to Lifeway, where I am now. Lifeway, for your listeners, is uh, pr- and again, I'm not trying to do bragging rights, but I think it's the largest Christian company in the world. Yeah, we have about five thousand employees scattered out all over the place. I am based in Nashville, and we make Christian resources and we sell mm-hmm. Christian resources. Mm-hmm. So that is the minute and 27 path. I went over I went over my allocated minute. <laughs> no, I appreciate that, Tom. You know, one of the things I just want to say is thank you to your service to the broader body of Christ. You know, you're one of those leaders that I look to and I really appreciate, you know, the work that you do. Obviously, not only at Lifeway, you guys do a lot of incredible work, Lifeway research, resources, research, all kinds of great things. And we're just honored to have you here today. You know, oftentimes we make a reference here at Unseminary to the fact that 94% of churches are losing ground against the growth of the communities they serve. So, you know, we're, 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 we've picked an interesting interesting market, for lack of a better word, to work with, right, to, 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 to be in. A lot of, you know, the, our brothers and sisters are losing ground against the, the communities they, they serve. Why do you, what do you believe are the major contributions to this reality to churches today? There, there would always be several, and I would not want to minimize the uh, the, the spiritual realities. Mm-hmm. Uh, so let me begin there, but then let's go to some practical realities mm-hmm. as well. Some of the spiritual realities is uh, many of our churches are prayerless. Mm-hmm. Uh, we, we give uh, lip service to prayer. Anytime there's mm-hmm. been a great, significant growth uh, in the church, uh, historically, it has been preceded by uh, significant, not program prayer, but mm-hmm. just just a burden for prayer. Uh, for 
what it, for what it, for whatever reason that is that is not existing. But then once we get beyond that, I don't think many of the reasons beyond that platform reason, that base reason, are necessarily theological or biblical in the classic sense. Mm-hmm. Uh, and those have to do with uh, leadership and relational skills. Hmm. And a um, lot of our pastors, a lot of our staff persons, and they say this, and uh, th- this is not any type of denigrating statement. No. They, they, they say this. I have not been trained to lead a church with a quarter of a million dollar budget, a half a million dollar budget. I have not been trained to lead multiple staff. Mm-hmm. I don't know how to deal uh, with with the, the the person that's constantly on my case. Mm-hmm. Uh, th- those type of things can so they they may end a pastor or staff's ministry, but at at the very least, they distract a mm-hmm. person mm-hmm. from that main focus that they should have, and so. Uh, what you do, uh, what I do, is uh, we're trying to fill a void. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, it's not necessarily a void created by the seminaries, mm-hmm. but it is it is it is a void that is there. Right. Uh, and and so, with without these w- without without these types of basic leadership relational skills that takes place, there's a, there's a third factor, and I and I said prayer. Mm-hmm. The basic skills of leadership and relational skills, and then the third factor is this: there is not a lot of intentionality. Mm. Uh, when I wrote a book called *The Unchurched Next Door* many years ago, mm-hmm. uh, part of the research in it was that uh, only five percent of unchurched people are resistant mm-hmm. to an invitation to church. Ninety-five mm-hmm. percent are either receptive or neutral, mm. and we have this false narrative that has taken place in, in many of our churches mm-hmm. that we cannot. Right. And, and and it goes to the leaders, it goes to the members, and many times we have surrendered. Mm-hmm. I, Rich, I remain uh, an obnoxious optimist about the church. <laughs> Me too. Just despite the fact that it's 90 plus that are losing ground in their community, I believe, because I'm seeing things that are happening mm-hmm. that I think can be more pervasively uh, understood across North America, and I, that's where I focus more than anywhere, mm, uh, and it and it – uh, I, I just I have hope in the midst of what seems to be a uh, a, a rather challenging scenario. Mm, no, I appreciate that, and that's what I appreciate about you. And I resonate with that. I'm in the same boat. I really do. I love the challenge that we that we have. I'll say to other church leaders, you know, God picked you to lead at this moment, which is pretty incredible. Now, yes. Let's talk a little bit about that. How you know how are you seeing churches engage with the cultures of their communities in a way you know that doesn't compromise the message of Jesus? They're able to kind of connect in, with their community, see people, reach out to the unchurched. Uh, but do that in a way that doesn't compromise with the message. The millennial generation is teaching me a lot. I don't know what year you were born, but mm-hmm. I have three sons that were born between 1980 and 2000, mm-hmm. uh, which is which is the millennial generation, about 78 million, the largest generation in America's history. Yep. And that generation has has taught me that true ministry, true evangelism that uh, has credibility and integrity behind it is built upon relationships, is built upon connecting with other people. Uh, I've watched my son, who is a church planner, and I've, I've uh, joined his church because it's in the Nashville area, mm-hmm. and I've, I've watched him and people in that church develop relationships, and people will say, tell me what's different about you, or tell me what's going on, or they'll come to church, and, and they'll hear a clear gospel message. There, there's always the swing of the Pendulum, Rich. The the uh, in the turn of the twentieth century, uh, there was uh, really a lot of uh, good deeds without mm-hmm. gospel, mm-hmm. and then the the pendulum swung the other way, and there was the gospel message without the gospel life. Mm. And now, what I'm seeing happen is we're seeing them come together, mm-hmm. and and we're seeing relationships that then give us the opportunity mm. to connect with people. So we're seeing churches that are following along that are saying, I want to get in the community, I want to make a difference, and uh, this isn't just about some type of memorized uh, uh, presentation, but the gospel is present in many of the things they say. Absolutely. No, that's that's amazing. You know, I really have seen that. You know, that I have a friend of mine, um, you know, would be a millennial leader who's planting a church right now, literally as they're speaking. And for him, it's very clear that it is both about the demonstration and the proclamation of the gospel, that they are, they're, they're worried about kind of the traditional thing. You know, I'm a, I'm a Gen Xer. I'm in that 1974, literally at the very bottom of the boom and then the bust. I was the, the least amount of people born in the year I was born wow. uh, in our country. Uh, but, uh, you know, his church is interesting because they really are trying to do both and, and hold really both very high, which is incredible. Are you seeing that as a trend, this kind of community service oriented kind of evangelism, for lack of a better word, as a trend across the broader church today? 
I'm seeing it as a trend across more younger churches, and right. I'm hoping that that will become an influence of, uh, of the older, more established churches. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I have a, I have a kind of a mentoring ministry uh, to pastors and others as well, and many of the older pastors now older. Not this, I'm, I'm a 61 year old. I'll mm-hmm. be 61 year old, so I'm not talking about necessarily as old as I am, but the from the 40 mid 40s and up, and they're they're asking questions about what's what do I need to be doing? How do I need to change? So there's an openness mm-hmm. to this older leadership to do the things that. Uh, some of the younger leadership is doing. And I'm, I'm hoping that the training uh, of the experience and then the training of what I'm doing currently as a young can, can flow both ways. Mm, very cool. Very cool. Well, change and tack a little bit. If you were starting out in ministry today, you stepped out after seminary uh, yeah. you're in going back into that first pastorate, uh, knowing what you know today, you know, what would have you done different when you started out in local church ministry? Gosh, almost everything. Uh, I, I, uh, first thing I do is fire me because I know I'm not, I know I'm not competent to lead a church. I mean, right. one of the one of the reasons I'm not there is because uh, there, there's so much about being a pastor and being a leader of a church. This is one of the toughest jobs in the world, and I Amen. I would doubt my own competency. Mm-hmm. I told Nellie Joe, my wife, one time that I was thinking about writing a book of that mistakes I've made in ministry. Mm-hmm. She said, "No, that'll be a multi-volume series." So I, <laughs> I, I, I I have I have not gone that path. She was but, willing to contribute to that. Is that what you're saying? She's like, I got a few ideas. <laughs> I think she had a few volumes, and not just, not, not just a That's few, not, not just a few ideas. Uh, there would be so many things mm. that uh, I, I would do differently. For one, uh, I tended. I, sometimes I blame it on my introverted personality, but that's no excuse. Uh, I, I tended to be less relational instead of more relational. Uh, I, I tended to spend more time in my office working on the message instead of working on the relationships with people. I never got that balance uh, exactly right. Um, I advocated, uh, especially in the established churches, since I served four of them. Mm-hmm. Uh, I advocated a leadership style that was incremental, that could take the people with me instead of uh, getting too far ahead. But I always got too far ahead, mm-hmm. and, it, and, it, and it brought me mm-hmm. problems. And I think the major reason behind it is I, I don't think I ever went into a church with a long-term view. Mm. I think I went into a church thinking, "What is the next church?" Oh, that's good. Now, I'm 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 not advocating that you, you're not supposed to leave a church after three or four years, but unless you're going into a clear situation where you know you're going to leave, like maybe a small rural church that's, uh, that uh, that while you're at Bible college or seminary, and you know, okay, when I graduate, I'll leave there. Uh, I made the mistake in my other churches of saying, okay, I'm coming to this church, and what's next? Mm-hmm. I'm coming to this church. Mm-hmm. Instead of saying, what now? Oh. And I was never present enough. And uh, climbing the ecclesiological ladder, uh, uh, looking to the next thing, those were some of the biggest mistakes I made, which means I never really invested in the community because in the back of my mind, I wasn't going to be in the community mm-hmm. long. So I made a huge mistake Mm. in how I approached church life because I was not ready to invest for the long haul. Even if I didn't stay for the long haul, Mm. my mindset needed to be, I'm here as long as I'm here and I'm going to invest. Hmm. Oh wow, that's I and I hope that encourages leaders who are listening in today. I know there's a lot of church, you know, leaders and pastors who do find themselves maybe a little bit discouraged, and you can pull back from your people. Maybe maybe not physically, but even just emotionally and mentally, and you kind of begin to put distance, which then becomes a vicious cycle. We know that, yep. right? It pushes in, and then ultimately, it, you know, you, you you do. I appreciate you know what you're saying there. We have to lean in on the communities that we're in um, today. You know, this is where God's called us to today. Let's you know, let's do that. Absolutely. You know, who are you learning from these days? You know, you're a leader that a lot of people look to. What are some other churches or organizations? It can be anything. You know, it can be a, a Christian organization or not that inspires you and motivates you. Uh, I have to say this. Um, I have a network that is a very natural network of uh, pastors and church leaders through an organization called Church Answers. Mm-hmm. And it is it is just it's it's basically a subscription based mentoring and different mm-hmm. levels of mentoring. Mm-hmm. You would not recognize the 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 churches most likely mm-hmm. and the leaders that are inspiring me because they do not have the marquee right. that a lot of others do. I'll, I'll give you I'll give you one example. Uh, he he has the 
the classic name for a pastor. His name is Chuck Angel. I mean, <laughs> I mean can't we, make that up. <laughs> yeah, who, who is our pastor? He, he's an angel. He's, pastor he, angel. He's, he's just an angel, <laughs> and uh, he is uh, he is a pastor of a church uh, called Foundry mm -hmm. in the Denver area, mm -hmm. and. Chuck got there. The attendance was two, had been 200, 186 to 190 for about 12 years in that mm. tight range of average attendance. And now against the human odds that people said it couldn't be done, the church is at 500, 600, oh, and, cool. it's, and it's a storefront church, and they're doing things that are even – uh, many, many times countercultural means that we do things that uh, 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 that are new. He's doing some countercultural things that are kind of retro, uh, and and he's and he's reaching some people when they said it could not be done. Huh. Highly relational, uh, highly connected with people, but methodologically, he's 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 just a genius. Mm. Uh, and so the the world does not know Chuck Angel. Maybe a few more will know him mm -hmm. uh, after this podcast. Mm -hmm. But uh, that 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 is a clear that is a clear example. Mm. Uh, that you know the blogosphere and the podcast world has some select leaders that are really putting out some good stuff. Mm -hmm. You're mm -hmm. one of them. Oh, thank you. Appreciate Nelson that. Searcy, uh, oh, fantastic. more yeah. on the established church level, mm -hmm. uh, is putting Kerry Newhoff. You know, oh, I, fantastic. I, Kerry's he, great. Yeah, I, I read his stuff uh, uh, continuously, mm -hmm. though Ron Edmondson doesn't, in my opinion, put out enough of the information. <laughs> he is one of the best, and he has taken a long-established church in Lexington, Kentucky, and turned it around. And I read everything that he writes. Mm -hmm. You know what? What? What I want to see is uh, I want. I want to see more of the riches out there because mm. the the field is not crowded enough. Mm. Uh, we we need we need more people speaking into the leadership of of churches on a very practical level. There's a lot of people speaking into it on a theological level, mm. but on the practical application, I'd like to see a lot more. Those are just a few examples. Oh, I appreciate that. Thank you uh, so much. Yeah, some great leaders. Um, you know, and a number of those guys actually been on the podcast. Great, you know, great stuff for sure. Well, Tom, I really appreciate you being on the show today. Anything you want to say in parting, you know, to our listeners? And then how can people get in touch? I want to make sure they tune into your podcast. One of the best. I love it. It's literally when it comes up, boom, I listen to it. Uh, Thank so you. how can people get in touch with you? Okay, uh, TomRainer.com, and that's a T-H-O-M, Rainer. There's another story into itself. Tom, <laughs> T-H-O-M-R-A-I-N-E-R.com is the blog site. And if you go to the blog site, uh, we're, we will be posting the podcast there as well. Of course, it's an iTunes podcast as well as other mm -hmm. servers, and uh, Rainer on the Leadership is the name of it. But TomRainer.com is the main way. And, and Rich, uh, my, my heart is for pastors and for other church leaders, mm -hmm. and I, I think the reason is I was such a lousy one that I <laughs> that I that I want the best for them and I and I I've I've experienced the pain and a lot of it a lot of it self inflicted. And uh my message for them is uh, invest in the people, love them unconditionally and have a long haul view, even if it doesn't end up being a long term pastorate, and just just see what God can do. And don't forget the power of prayer mm. and uh organizing your people that uh they may be more intentional about prayer as well. Thank you so much, Tom. Really appreciate you being on the show. Hope you have a great rest of your day. Thanks, Rich. It's been great Thank to be here. Thank you for tuning in to this week's Unseminary podcast. Don't be shy. We'd love to connect. Check out Unseminary Inbox. You can sign up at unseminary.com and we'll send you helpful training resources every week. Plus, you'll gain immediate access to our exclusive members area with tons of resources you can use. Connect with Rich on Twitter at Rich Birch or through email rich at unseminary.com Don't forget to check out the show notes for this episode at unseminary.com It includes links to what we talked about today and more. Leave a comment. We'd love to hear from you. Did you enjoy today's episode? Drop by iTunes and leave a review. Thanks again for tuning in to this week's Unseminary podcast. Join us next week when we'll learn more stuff we wish they taught in seminary.